Miami Hurricanes spring football is so much fun, not just to watch the returning starters, but to watch the depth and to watch the competition. Let's talk about sleepers. You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Alex Dono, your host. I'm a University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet and contributor to allhurricanes.com. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We are available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. So as we're about a week and a half away from the Miami Hurricanes spring game, nine days away to be exact, get this great question from our good pal Chalupa Batman, who wrote this to us on our subtext texting platform. He says, hey, who are some of your sleepers to watch for the spring game? We'll all be watching Tyler Van Dyke, Jakari Brown, and some of the big names. But who's flying under the radar that you think will have a good showing? This is such a great question uh, because especially considering um, how little depth Miami has in the spring game because, you know, there's a lot of defensive linemen who are out, running backs who are out, etc., uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of players getting big time reps and snaps on that field April 14th that you may not see a whole lot of in the regular season coming up. And so for me, I'm going to start at running back because, guys, right now in spring practice, the walk on running backs actually outnumber the scholarship backs right now because Travante Citizen is not out there and Mark Fletcher and Chris Johnson, the incoming freshmen, have not arrived yet. Okay. So. I'm expecting to see a lot of walk-on running backs get some serious burn in the spring game. Remember last year, Devon Perry had an awesome game. Uh, so I'm going to be watching Michael Perino from New York, who is actually one of the fastest players on the team. So his speed can be a big weapon if he can get to the second level, get out to the open field. Uh, Terrell Walden, I'm a huge fan of. Another walk-on back, a guy that I know less about, but I've seen him out there on the field and practices. Sincere Sampson is the other walk-on back, number 44. Uh, he's not very tall, but he's kind of built like a bowling ball. He's about five foot nine, but he's pretty thick at 220 pounds, and he carries it pretty well. So the walk-on running backs, to me, are going to be a big area of focus. Um, you know, I mentioned defensive line, specifically a defensive tackle. I don't know if you call these guys sleepers because they got a lot of publicity coming in through the transfer portal, but – Branson Dean and Thomas Gore, uh, I think, are going to be interesting to watch. And guys, you know, I watched enough of his tape from Georgia State. And if what Thomas Gore was able to do against inferior competition there, if any of that can translate into the ACC or in the case of the spring game going up against Miami's really good looking offensive line, Thomas Gore is going to be a lot of fun to watch this year because that dude has a crazy motor, deceptive amount of speed, covers a lot of ground, very rangy defensive tackle who's going to be making tackles in the backfield where you're like, wait, how did a DT get into the backfield fast enough to make that play? Uh, so hopefully some of that can translate over. That's going to be a really fun guy to watch as well. Um, Ahmad Moten is someone that we will all be watching because hopefully he's part of the bright future at defensive tackle. Um, now at linebacker, I'm really going to be closely watching in the spring game a guy who's been getting so many positive reviews and headlines from his coaches, and that is Bobby Washington, the early enrollee freshman. Because any chance you get to ask his position coach or to ask Mario Cristobal, they're all raving about Bobby Washington, who's looked great in the spring so far. And one of the reasons why I'm going to be watching Bobby so closely in the spring game, Malik Bryant as well, if I can get a look at him, is because, you know, when they open up these practices to the media, um, we're kind of relegated to a certain part of the field. And the linebackers, unfortunately, are usually on like the opposite side of the field. I got to get binoculars. I'm going to try to bring out binoculars to the Thursday practice to watch these guys a little bit more closely. I tend to have the best view from where I'm at of the quarterbacks, receivers, running backs, and the defensive backs. And I don't get as good of a view of the offensive line, defensive line, and some of the other uh, defensive positions like linebackers. So, but Bobby Washington has just been getting these crazy good reviews from his coaches. And, you know, he looks good to me when I've seen him up close and personal physically uh, back to the offense, a wide receiver, 
Um, you know, obviously everyone's going to be watching Colby Young and Jacoby George. Those aren't sleepers. And by the way, Jacoby George, I'll mention, is having a really good spring, as is Colby. Uh, but I'm going to be watching Isaiah Horton, right? Had a really quiet year last year as a true freshman, only had one catch. Uh, but he's been playing really well, looks more assertive out there in spring practice. He's got that size at six foot four with a really good wingspan. So I'll be watching him. I'll be watching the young pups out there. Robbie Washington, you know, the twin brother of Bobby. The Washingtons are just out there dominating, right? I'm going to be watching Robbie at wide receiver, Ray Ray Joseph as well. I'm always watching him. Uh, so at, at corner, uh, one guy that I'm going to watch that I don't think people talk about as much, not a young guy, very experienced guy, graduate transfer, Terry Roberts Jr., the former Iowa cornerback who's taken his talents to Coral Gables. I'm going to be watching Terry Roberts, not only a corner, but I think he's going to play various roles on special teams as well. Was a really good special teams player in addition to being a really good cover corner at Iowa. So I'm going to be watching him uh, at safety. Keep your eyes on number 15, Markeith Williams. He's been looking really good and fluid out there. When I see him running drills, one-on-ones, individual drills, he's looking really fluid out there. He seems to be filling out his frame uh, in the weight room a little bit, was a little bit undersized last year as a true freshman. I think the future is bright for Markeith Williams. Now, on the offensive line, and I'm so pumped up about this dude, I put him on the cover, the cover photo for this episode. Uh, no, I'm not going to tell you about the five stars. We all know about the five stars, right? Uh, Mauingoa and Okun Lola, but I'm going to be watching Antonio Tripp on that offensive line, who is like, you know, when it comes to that freshman class coming in, Antonio Tripp was like the heart and soul of that Miami Hurricanes incoming 2023 recruiting class. This guy committed to Miami very early last year and was really um, a cheerleader and a champion for others to join him at the U. I love his spirit. I love his enthusiasm, is intoxicating, and he's also a darn good interior offensive lineman. So whatever, however many reps Antonio Tripp is going to get in that spring game, I'm going to be watching him very closely. I'm a huge fan of his. And then, you know, the last quote unquote sleeper I'm going to throw out to you is, you know, remember we have a new Australian punter, new Aussie. We go uh, into now Dylan Joyce. Lou Headley is out. Uh, Dylan Joyce is in. And, you know, he doesn't have tattoos, at least not the way that Lou Headley does, uh, but he does have a mustache and he does have that Australian style, which is like a punting factory down under. So Dylan Joyce at punter, I want to watch him in the spring game because, you know, the last couple of years, Miami was pretty darn spoiled, right? I mean, to have Lou Headley punting so efficiently and just so consistently as he did, like punting was never a problem the last couple of years for Miami. You know, you remember uh, years ago, and you remember when uh, when Jeff Fiegel's his kid was here? That was not so good. Zach Fiegel's, you know, and at kicker, I think, didn't you have in the same era, you had uh, Bubba Baxa kicking and, and Zach Fiegel's punting, like everything was a shank just left and right. You know, we, we haven't had that problem in recent years. So hopefully the transition from one Aussie to another, goes very smooth for Miami. So that was an awesome question there by Chalupa Batman. Now he reached us through our new SMS texting service on Locked on Canes. It's a service called Subtext. And if you guys want to get in on this, because I do one-on-ones with everybody on Subtext and I send out some uh, breaking news and show preview group chat messages, you'll get stuff there on the Subtext before it gets talked about here on a show. Uh, you can just click a link. I'm going to put uh, I'm going to include a link into the show description to our texting service. You click that link. It is a premium service, but you get the first 14 days absolutely free. And then if you want to stick around, if you're getting value from it, which is I'm always trying to bring value to this, you can opt in. And then it's four ninety nine a month from that point out. And remember, guys, here on Locked on Canes. I don't give you my Venmo or my cash app information. I'm not looking for donations. That's not how we do it here. Now, the show is completely free, but some of you have asked if there's ways you can support the show financially just beyond supporting our awesome advertisers. And so we came up with this network wide, this subtext platform, which is a way for you to say thank you financially, but you're also getting value in return. I'm not just going to throw out my cash app and be like, hey, you know, send me money. I want money. No, we're giving you value in return. So check out our subtext texting platform. The link is going to be in the show description below. 
and you can sign up for the first 14 days completely free so you have nothing to lose there. We've got some other awesome questions that came in from you guys. Is quarterback a growing concern, not so much in the present, but in the future? Quarterback recruiting, where are we with that? And uh, how do we look at cornerback? We got a question about that. So we're going to tackle some of these. Plus, later in this episode, we'll talk about the latest accolade for the Miami Hurricanes basketball team coming off a historic season. You want to keep it locked right here. We're only getting started on a new episode of Locked on Canes. Oh, I'm only getting started on FanDuel, my friends. The NBA playoffs are almost here. My heat might end up in the play-in. That's exciting, I guess. Uh, but now it's the perfect time to get on all, on all the action to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That means bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use, by the way. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scorers and threes drained. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So do not miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet. Up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We are available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. Make sure you make Locked on College Basketball your second listen. They're wrapping up a great season. Andy Patton and Isaac Shea do an awesome job. Available on Apple Podcasts, Odyssey, Spotify, wherever you get your pods. Let's go back into questions. We got uh, this one comes uh as well from our subtext chat we'll get to some twitter questions as well uh but the subtext uh questions are automatically bumped to the front of the line um quarterback is a growing concern missed on rashada this year and now it appears miami could miss out on aaron noland this week okay he says we need that elite one to get wide receivers and to the 24-25 playoff. He says, Jakari Brown is developing. Emery Williams is young. We have only three scholarship quarterbacks. Do we go into the portal and get a formal four-star type of guy? And then he says for recruiting, because I've talked about on this show, Miami's going to try to take two in the class of 2024. I think they're going to try to get two quarterbacks this class. They tried two last year. Uh, he says, two in the same class I'm not a fan of, need separation of eligibility. I know portal uh can and will happen he's what well, and that's one of the big reasons why a lot of schools are taking two these days and why i think miami will try to take two because the transfer portal the only thing you know predictable about it is that it's unpredictable right and you get a couple of quarterbacks in and then you kind of let like i don't know like what, what would it be like darwinism take over or like the cream rises to the top dog eat dog whatever you want to call it you bring in a couple of guys they compete and then maybe one of them figures out mm -hmm. i don't have as much of a path to start here so maybe i take my talent somewhere else a lot of it is a numbers game right and if you trust your coaching and hopefully you know shannon dawson is doing a good job with these quarterbacks and the next crop of quarterbacks that come in if you trust your coaching and your development you bring in a couple of quarterbacks and it just gives you more of an opportunity that one of them, if not both of them, are going to end up being really, really good because obviously you risk losing guys in that transfer portal, which can hurt your numbers. So, you know, there's going to be a pecking order. Like if you take two quarterbacks, I think one of them is going to know like I'm probably the second option here. I, I think he's going to have to understand that. Um, as far as what you're saying about the transfer portal quarterbacks, Here's my thing. If anyone out there, because he talked about a four-star type, okay? If anyone out there thinks you can just go and pluck like a starting caliber power five quarterback to come to Miami, it's just not going to happen because, you know, like him or not, Tyler Van Dyke is here. He is very talented and he knows this team and this offense and he's getting to know these new coaches already and he knows Mario so well, like, Tyler Van Dyke is almost the for sure starter. I mean, basically 99.99999% job security as the starting quarterback this coming year. If you're going to try to get like a former four-star type of quarterback, like someone who's a, a ready-made power five starting QB, and they hit the transfer portal, 
they're not going to want to come to a place that already kind of has a guy like Tyler. They're going to look somewhere where they're clearly better than the incumbent quarterback and they can basically walk into a program and start. So my thing is, if Miami does bring in a quarterback in the portal next month, it's going to be someone not really to to take Tyler's job, but potentially to take Jakari Brown's backup job or even Emery Williams' third quarterback job. Because Emery, to me, I you know, for as impressed as I am with what the early enrollee freshman is doing out there, his size, his arm, uh, his footwork look really, really good. You know, I, I don't I don't want to see him on the field as a true freshman. I mean, mop up duty against Bethune Cookman aside, that may be the one time we see him this year. I don't want to see Emery thrust into the situations that Jakari Brown was thrust into last year where he had to come out and play significant snaps and even start a couple of games. I don't want that for Emery because it's not fair to him. So you know what? Last year showed us, you know, it's not that common around the country to use three different quarterbacks, but Miami had to use three different quarterbacks last year. It can happen. And if you're down to that third guy and it's a true freshman, you're not going to win a lot of games in that situation. So, you know, if, if you bring in, you know, a veteran kind of journeyman type who's a more solid third option or potentially second option, I think that's what you do. But it's not going to be a former four-star caliber type of guy. But, you know, I will say this. For the backup quarterback situation, the more that I watch, the more comfortable I feel with Jakari Brown as my second quarterback that I, he is working so hard and he is improving his footwork and his accuracy so much to go along with all of the dynamic traits that he already has as a runner. And just it, and he's he's towering individual. I mean, Jakari Brown is, is gigantic. He looks the part, okay? And he's starting to look the part as a passer in addition to as a runner. I feel a lot more comfortable about Jakari being my second quarterback now than I did coming out of last year. Like he played really well against Georgia Tech outside of that. He just wasn't ready. He's a lot closer to ready this year than he was last year. So maybe I worry more about the emergency third quarterback than I would even about the second quarterback because Jakari also, as a dual threat guy, he has those sort of traits of quarterbacks Shannon Dawson has worked with very well in the past, like Clayton Toon at Houston, who put up record numbers last year under Dawson. He was a dual threat type of guy. So I'm feeling better about the quarterback situation from that standpoint. We get a question from Todd who says, hey, Dono, quick question. Is this Air Nolan to Ohio State? Is that a done deal? He says, do we still have a chance there? Um, it's not a done deal, okay? So what's going on with Air Nolan is – uh, there's clearly been a leak. Okay. You know, he's going to announce his verbal commitment on Saturday. And up until I'm going to say up until about three days ago, uh, I thought Miami was, you know, maybe close to being the favorite for him. And then, you know, it's, 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 it's now strongly expected coming out of a really good weekend visit that he had at Ohio state where he received, finally, he received an offer from Ohio State. Uh, I was told that he has considered OSU to be his quote-unquote dream school, okay? And I'm sure he loves the fact that they already have Jeremiah Smith, the top player in the country at wide receiver, committed, verbally committed to play there. Um, you know, it's there. there's a rumor that he may already be silently committed to Ohio State. So there, there's just there, there's a lot of buzz that Nolan – is going to be picking Ohio State this Saturday, April 8th, when he announces his verbal commitment. But listen, folks, it hasn't happened yet. Like, he hasn't announced that yet. Nothing has been 100% confirmed or decided. For those who have been following recruiting, especially in recent years, it's crazy. <laughs> like, recruiting is crazy. I mean, you know, uh, Cormani McLean, for, oh, I shouldn't have said his name. He whose name shall not be spoken managed to shock, like, three different schools last year. And look what happened with Jaden Rashada last year like recruiting is so crazy uh, and so much can change just in a matter of minutes hours and days that nothing is a hundred percent for sure but I am operating under the expectation that Aaron Nolan is not going to pick Miami on Saturday I am operating on un operating under that expectation because I try to be honest with you guys, right? Some people accuse me of being just, you know, a, a Miami cheerleader and I just, you know, we're getting everybody. No, man, if 
if I if I really think we're going to miss out on somebody, I, I tell it like it is. And I hope something changes in the next couple of days. But I am not expecting Aaron Nolan to, to pick Miami on April 8th. That's where we're at. But nothing is official yet. Uh, Todd also asked us, is there any evidence that John Ruiz is slowing down his NIL efforts? Uh, I haven't seen any evidence of that in, in real life. I know that. Darren Ravel, who loves to stir the pot, and he seems to have like a weird agenda against Miami and Ruiz, like tweeted something about how um, Ruiz's company didn't turn out the revenue that they had promised to turn out last year. And then uh, that that's all over the Gator blogs. And like somebody sent me a link to some website called Bro Bible. Yeah, that's where all my hard hitting news comes from Bro Bible. <laughs> Where they where they claim that you know that they're out of money, like oh they don't have any more, and I no, I, I haven't seen any actual evidence of that. I think that they're still they're still going strong, you know, taking care of of players, and you know, honestly, it's one of the most transparent nil efforts in America because you know people always put the spotlight on Ruiz. There have been other spots around the country, including that old Gator Collective, you know, a few hours north of me where, uh, you know, they promised a 13, what was it, $13.8 million that they just couldn't pay to a certain player. But yet everyone wants to talk about Ruiz, right, when his checks aren't bouncing. Uh, we got a couple more questions. Oh, we got a question about how Miami looks at corner. And, and I'm going to need you guys to help me out with this. Uh, help me understand why there's so much rage and anger over the Hard Rock Stadium parking situation for next year, because I see a lot of complaints about that on social media. Keep it locked right here to Locked on Canes. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We are available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. And another thing I want to bring up to you guys, I know that unfortunately for us, uh, the Miami Hurricanes don't have a whole lot of NFL draft prospects this year, but Tyreek Stevenson has been turning a lot of heads, and so is Will Mallory. So they're both going to be drafted for sure. The Locked On Network has a really informative and free NFL draft newsletter, okay? And so I'm going to include a link in the show description on how you can sign up for this. I subscribe to it. And it's really informative because not only am I a Canes guy, I'm also a Miami Dolphins fan. So I'm, you know, I pay attention to the NFL draft and I love the NFL. So if you want to be updated on everything going on with the NFL draft, team needs, team strategies, prospect breakdowns, you want to subscribe to this free Locked On Network NFL draft newsletter. I'm going to include the link here on the show description because it's really, really helpful. And I know that the folks who put it together put a lot of work into it because I do some writing myself for allhurricanes.com, so I know how much work goes into player evals and profiles and stuff, and, man, they they put a lot of work into that NFL Draft newsletter. But thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We are part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, we get a question from West Michi Kane, who says – how does Miami look at cornerback? Uh, you know, cornerback is very compelling to me. And this is another group. I'm going to be watching these guys really closely in the spring game because, you know, you lost a lot of experience from Tyreek Stevenson and from DJ Ivy. I know, you know, say what you want to about DJ. He he was he was like a, it was like a 15th year senior by the time he left here. Like DJ was very, very experienced and you've lost that now at corner. You did get some experienced guys in the portal. I think the starters at corner are going to be Devontae Brown, who just transferred in from UCF, and Daryl Porter, who uh, you know he transferred last year and was a backup last year. I think Daryl Porter and Devontae Brown probably project out to be the starters. Uh, you know, Devontae had a good run at UCF the last couple of years. Uh, Porter, um, I, to me, you know, he was uh, he was good at times, not so good at times last year in a backup role. Um, I, I think he's he's showing signs of improvement so far in spring and in the offseason conditioning program. So I think Porter, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that he, he can have a good year this year. You know, I mentioned Terry Roberts, who comes in as veteran depth. I think that's important because you got a lot of young guys who I think have bright futures, but are a little bit unproven, you know, Malik Curtis and Jaden Harris. I like Chris Graves, actually. Uh, I like Chris Graves. I, I think that's a guy who is someone we can watch out for. He's just looked really solid with his technique and his speed and practice. So I'm not sleeping on Graves either. 
Uh, and then, you know, you got coming in, they haven't arrived yet. The true freshmen, they didn't enroll early, uh, but Damari Brown and Robert Stafford, uh, you know, these guys, I don't know, they may play some as true freshmen, but these are the guys to watch out for in the future. I think these guys are going to be impact players at the university of Miami. So, I'm going to say there's just there there's a lot of there's a lot of unproven depth at corner and that that could be it could just as easily be an area of weakness or it could be like a, an area of oh my god I can't believe these guys are this good wow we've turned this into an area of strength so that's one of those areas uh, I think that uh, there, there's a very high ceiling and maybe a very low floor for how good the corners could be this year so I will be watching them get a question from Orwell on Twitter. And you can tweet us at Locked on Canes. And if you follow us at Locked on Canes, we will follow you back. How about that? We follow everybody back. Uh, you know, we try not to follow back the porn spammers. Sometimes I do by accident and then they slide into the DMs and then I unfollow them after that. It happens. I don't I don't always look that closely at who I'm following back. But, you know, if, if you're a legitimate human being, you're definitely getting the follow back uh, on Locked on Canes. Uh, question from Orwell is, does UM realize how they have pissed off the fans with their increased ticket costs and parking debacle. Now, I guess like the increased ticket costs, I, I think that's just predictable. It's like, you know, that that's every, every sports team in America, the ticket prices are going up. I hate to say it, right? Cause I, you know, I don't, I don't want to be paying these exorbitant ticket prices either. The parking situation though is, is more intriguing to me. What's going on with that. So and by the way, you guys need to fill me in. If I'm getting anything wrong with the way that I describe this, let me know in the comments and let me know on Twitter at Locked on Canes because I've been reading up on what's happening with the parking. Every home game, I work, okay? I'm in the press box. I do not tailgate, and I don't get to select my own parking. I just park wherever they tell me to park. So I'm not familiar with some of this stuff. But from what I can tell, Hurricanes fans, season ticket holders, people who have been going to games for years, they're really upset that they've not only apparently reconfigured some of the parking lots in the stadium and some of the lots that used to exist no longer exist, which separates a lot of folks who have tailgated together for years. And they're also doing this directed parking just about everywhere, meaning you have a parking attendant that tells you exactly what space to park in rather than you trying to, you know, go to a certain spot to line up side by side with your tailgating friends, right? Who you always tailgate next to. So listen, I would be upset too, right? There's so much more that goes into the live game experience than just sitting in your seats inside the stadium. I mean, it's the college football culture. People tailgate for hours before these games. And many of you have been tailgating with the same friends of yours who you see every, you know, six, seven Saturdays a year. You've done this together for years or decades. OK, so I assume that with this directed parking thing, you know, they're probably trying to improve like the traffic flow inside the stadium. Uh, and I'm going to be honest here. I'm not sure if all of these changes come directly from the university or if it's from stadium management, because remember, you know, Miami doesn't own the stadium, Stephen Ross and the Dolphins do. So I don't know if this stuff is coming more from the stadium than it is from the university. If anyone knows that, let me know. I'm curious to see if there are any change. <coughs> I get worked up when I talk about this stuff. I'd be curious to see if there's any changes with the Dolphin game day parking, because I don't know if that's happening or not. So you guys let me know if you're upset about the parking situation, if you've been affected by it. Leave us a comment on YouTube. Leave us a tweet at Locked on Canes. Guys, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're like this close to 9,000 subscribers, which is pretty awesome because we've been doing this now for less than a year. It's been about 11 months. And if you prefer to listen to the audio version, that's fantastic. I don't, I don't care how you consume the show. Just consume it, right? So you want to subscribe to our audio feed on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, the Odyssey app, wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a five-star rating and review if you can. And folks, we will talk to you again next time on another episode of Locked on Canes, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.